This is Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to the podcast. Chris Graham joined today on this Friday by Jerry Carter on the long phone line all the way across the continent. Jerry is uh, Jerry is back home in Washington State, but you know the, the communications of our era, we can, we can act like we're in the same room like we were a couple weeks ago. Jerry, thanks for joining us. So this is the first international podcast in street knowledge history, and so momentous occasion that this is. Here we are. Uh, let's talk now. So we're going to we're talking international, but we're going to kind of stay local. If you'll, you know, especially in the context of ACC sports. We'll start with football. Uh, and an observation: Jerry and I were trading emails. We we plan to talk uh, today for the podcast. And uh, Jerry sent an observation that after last night's uh, of ACC football weekend opener, Virginia Tech, Georgia Tech, Georgia Tech, the huge win in Blacksville, 49-28. So now we have this odd anomaly. Okay, so Georgia Tech blows out Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech, a few weeks ago, pretty impressively beat Duke on the road at Duke. And then Duke, down to Georgia Tech, beat the heck out of Georgia Tech. You were there for that one, Jerry. And so... What's going on? I mean, it's not just that they won. You know, these three teams beat each other by a point or two. They owned each other, but in a way that the transitive property that you used in math class back in ninth grade would not make any sense of. What's going on here, Jerry? Well, Chris, the one thing you want to add to that that makes it even more dumbfounding is each time it was the road team that dominated the home team. Oh, yeah. And you, you love to play the games. Everybody likes doing it. You saw that I think Liberty beat O Dominion by 42 points earlier this year, and that ODU beats Virginia Tech by X number of points. Well, that means that Liberty is 60 points better than Virginia Tech. <laughs> we know that. We know that part's not true. But when you're looking at these things, the ACC is literally swinging from week to week, and it comes down to the level of preparation and the matchups. I'm sitting there the week before Duke played at Georgia Tech. They went up to Louisville on a less than desirable weather night, completed one pass for 12 yards, and ran for almost 600 yards. So I'm sitting there, and I'm going, oh, my God. Two weeks ago, they they were a bad football team. Georgia Tech started out very slow. They lost the game to Pitt. They picked up a couple of win, minor wins, but then they go, and then they score 60 on Bowling Green. Well, then they score 60-plus on Louisville, and you're going, what chance does Duke have to go down to Georgia Tech and shut down that offense? So, now, you go down there, I was able to get to that one, and Duke shuts down that offense. That's the leading offense of ground offense in the country. Duke just shuts them down. So you're going, wow, Duke has a really good defensive matchup. There was a scheme there designed for Georgia Tech. But fast forward one week, Duke tries to play defense against Virginia. And to say it didn't work would be nice. <laughs> you know, Virginia, you follow Virginia football pretty well. And you understand what's going on there. They look like, I think my quote to you was, they were doing an Alabama impersonation. Yeah. Yeah. In the first half there, it was a situation where that game very easily could have been 24-0 at the half. Yeah. And Virginia was just clicking on all three. So then you start going backwards, and you're going, well, this doesn't make any sense anymore. It's not, it's not predictable anymore. Well, what happened last night in Blacksburg? Normally, I stay away from reading the feeds, but you know, Mike Barber, who the Richmond Times is fat, was one of the people that was kind of active with it. Because I was curious as to what the coaching staff at Virginia Tech was going to say. Because if you, if you watch the game, you'll know this. If not, the staff will show you. They did not complete a pass last night, Chris. Right. When you're, when you're sitting there and you know what's coming, how is it that you can't stop it? And then what happened to the Tech offense after the third drive? It's just, it's really, it's a fun year to be a fan. And uh, one of the t- 
tweets from the Virginia Tech site last night. Hey, it's our favorite time of the year where all of our haters will turn on all of our diehards and they'll fight about whether the end of the world is coming or not. (laughs) (laughs) And it is, right? Because from week to week it feels like it's coming. You, You made some great points there. I watched that game pretty much play for play last night, and, and I'd watched a lot of that Duke-Georgia uh, Tech game that you were at down in Atlanta a few weeks ago, and they were two different teams. They, and, 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 you know, it, it, was, it was interesting about last night from Georgia Tech was when you see that offense working at its best, Paul, Paul Johnson only has he – doesn't, he has all the plays in his head, and he just kind of, he calls them out. He, he, he sends a guy in each play, shuttles guys back and forth, no signal, anything else. He just calls it based on feel, but there's it's it's pretty simple. There's a dive. There's the dive play for the fullback, the quarterback keeper. Uh, there's a pitch. You know they'll they'll do that that kind of wind up pitch to a to a, a running back in motion. Uh, kind of like it's kind of like a, a screen pass in a way. You know, the pass out in the flat because the running back gets a little bit of momentum going downhill with that pitch, and they'll run some sprint options and things like that. But there's only like five or six plays. And Bud Foster has coached against Paul Johnson for close to 15 years now. Now they only Virginia Tech only had two players last night uh, who had played against Georgia Tech, but Bud Foster's coached against him. He's got tape. He he knows how to he knows the drill here. And last night Virginia Tech couldn't couldn't stop it. Now and so if you're a Virginia Tech fan now, you know going into last night the Hokies were three and zero in the ACC. Yeah, they lost to ODU. Yeah, they lost to Notre Dame. But you're still three and zero in the ACC. You still have. You know, your your fate in your own hands. You win out. You know, you're going to go to the ACC championship game. Uh, if you lose to Clemson, even there, you're still going to play in the Orange Bowl. That's the way that works. If you lose to a team that we, we assume Clemson is going to be in the uh, playoff, that uh, you know, you go to the ACC championship game, you're going to go to the Orange Bowl. Well, now all of a sudden they lose last night. They lose bad. Now they're four and three overall. That's what you're thinking about now. If you're a Hokies fan, if you last night you were three and zero in the ACC, now you're four and three. Uh, you've had three bad losses in terms of you know getting beat by double digits, and uh, and for Georgia Tech, I don't know. Next week, I guess they'll probably go score ten points on somebody because Paul Johnson's four and four. How's that team four and four? That team we saw last night. How are they four and four? So you're right, Jerry. It reminds me a lot of the NFL now. From week to week, you just don't know who's going to be good, who's going to you know have a great game one week and, and have a dud the next week in the NFL. The ACC Coastal plays like the NFL. Uh, and that's a big surprise. Well, the other thing we need to add to the fact um, where last night was concerned, Chris, that was Georgia Tech's backup quarterback. Yeah, yeah. That, that was not their starting quarterback. And, and I was reading through some of Bud Foster's quotes, and it, it made me flash back to one of the greatest lines I, I, I've ever heard, John McKay, uh, back in the second season of Kent Bay. Of course, he was the original coach of the Buccaneers. And somebody asked him after a loss. They refreshed people's mind. They opened up their franchise by losing their first 26 games. Right. It went 14 and then went 0-12 in year two. And they asked him, he said, well, coach, what do you think about the execution of your defense? And, uh, and John McKay snaps back. He goes, at this point, I'd approve it. <laughs> that was that, that's 40 years, and it's just stuck with me. And I'm sitting there, and when they were talking to Bud Foster last night, I'm going, "Wow, what are you? What are you going to say here? You know, you have backup quarterback at Old Dominion. Yeah, score 59 on you. And if Georgia Tech doesn't take a knee, Chris, last night, or, or run the clock out, if you will, yeah. that's just it's, I, I don't know what you say there. And that was a great point you just made. Again, you were 4-2, and two, but you were 3-0 and oh in the league. So you, you could still sit there, okay, oops, we had the Oops game with ODU. No shame losing to Notre Dame. Right. But it got real. It just got real in a big way. And that leads us to this. You know, this is the first week where all seven uh, matches, matchups are ACC football. Yeah. And that brings us to a huge thing on Saturday. You might know the answer to this, but if UVA takes care of business with UNC, they will be alone in first place in the Coastal. Can you tell me the last time that's happened? I don't think it has happened. Uh, it, 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 do you have Do you have information other than? But I don't. I don't remember that it has happened. 
I was scratching my head. I could not find it. I mean, obviously, if you go back to the glory days, that was pre-coastal yeah. division. Yeah. And it's a situation. So, and then before you can put that one in the checkbox, one of the, uh, you talked about how Georgia Tech 4-4. Four four. Let's take a look at UNC. Yeah. Every week, every week that I'm just ready to just throw USC, UNC in the category of worst team ever, they come back and they play really, really respectable. Yeah. They're in a situation there where uh, I was there to the pack. Yeah. They ended up losing the game uh, in overtime. So, but if Virginia takes care of business, all of a sudden, after, after Virginia beat you, and that's the, that's the most fun game of the year for me, the Virginia Duke game, because it's kind of the win-win game. Mm-hmm. And after Virginia wins that, I look at the remaining schedule. I don't know if every fan does this or not, but I look at the remaining schedule, and I'm going, wow, that schedule's got 9-3 and three written all over it. It's got 9-3 and three written all over it. Last night, after last night, Chris, I'm not sure it doesn't have 10 and 2 written all over it. Well, you know the the Virginia does the, the, the they're in a stretch right now starting Saturday with with North Carolina, Pitt, and Liberty, a non conference game, obviously Liberty. Yeah, that's that you, you're favored in all three of those. If you just take care of business, you're eight and two, and then yeah, you finish at Georgia Tech, at Virginia Tech, and it depends on which which week you get Georgia Tech. And I'm, I've I got to do the math ahead. Because one week Georgia Tech is great. They're like the the old the old thing about the little girl with the curl. When they're good, they're very good. When they're bad, they're very bad. Um, this is this is a so I, I want to figure out which which part of the of that duopoly there they are. Are they are they the good? Are they the are they the Jekyll or are they the Hyde? Basically, uh, to use another uh, an analogy. So, uh, but yeah, that schedule. There, there's nobody for Virginia that they don't have a chance to beat. They're, certainly, they they're you know including Carolina. I'll say this about the Carolina game. You're right, Jerry. I, I pointed that out this week, too, uh, on a couple of columns and a couple of podcasts. What scares me about Carolina is that they're 1-5, they're and, and, you know, but they, they've not been playing that bad the last two weeks. You mentioned they had the seven point, they had a seven-point lead against Syracuse in the fourth quarter loss in overtime. They should have beaten Virginia Tech two weeks ago. They had a 19-14 lead at home six minutes ago, first and goal at the one, fumbled at the one-yard line. Virginia Tech goes 98 yards and wins with 19 seconds left. I mean, that's... That's skin of the teeth win for Virginia Tech. It was also the skin of the teeth loss for for Carolina. So now, yeah, they lost to Miami 47-10 the week before that. Got blown out by ECU the week before that. But they're playing better now, and nobody expects them to win. Virginia's a nine and a half point favorite going into this one on Saturday. Um, and Virginia last last year had a similar situation. And this is you know you got you, you kind of look for historical patterns. Last year, Virginia went into that Carolina game. They won 2014 down in Chapel Hill, but Carolina was a one-win team. Virginia was riding high, had just beaten Boise State, had just beaten Duke in back-to-back weeks, and then they, they had a struggle to beat Carolina last year, a one-win Carolina team last year. Well, this year, Virginia comes in after a big win over Miami, another win over Duke, and you've got Carolina. So, uh, you know, history repeats itself. I hope that the, the folks in that locker room have learned the lesson of respect your opponent no matter what the record is and what the margin is uh but yeah this 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 not guaranteed but all that said jerry you know i'm sure you you, you're you're aware of this there are a lot of folks around here uh around where i'm sitting you know charlottesville area thinking boy we could be playing in charlotte we've never done that before uh what does that even feel like and it's it's even weird to say it out loud because you're almost like i'm gonna jinx it i'm gonna ruin it by just saying it out loud so it is a weird place to be in for a Virginia fan. Well, it's a, it's a weird place, and it'll be dealt with with a great deal of skepticism. Mm-hmm. You know, I was talking to one of my uh, good buddies, Alan, after the Duke game. He didn't get a chance to watch it, and I told him that that was the most dominating performance I've seen UVA put on a football field in a long time. Every aspect of the game, every aspect of the game, Special teams, offense, and defense. I think these guys are for real. And I, I, I love the, the respect that Bronco and Cut have for each other. All of the quotes were incredibly positive, talking about you know how the game went. But wow, that was a a very solid performance. And of course, you know, now the UVA fan, he goes, "Well, you know, let's just hope they can keep doing it." And so the question becomes, when does it feel real? Yeah. I think Char- I think Charlotte is very believable. 
And it, it's something to where I would love to see it happen. I think the year that Duke made it down there um, is when we, were, when we were matched up against Florida State in the uh, – uh, when Florida State was peaking, so uh, down to the game, and I told her, I said, "Hey, don't don't get surprised when we get beat forty-two to seven. I said, but well, we're going to get to go. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get to stand next to the trophy. We're going to get to, you know, to experience it. And I, I felt bad for Bronco after. And you and I have talked about the bowl, how the bowl scenario played out last year." You know, Duke and UVA were technically were, they were tied at six and six. So UVA had the tiebreaker because they beat them, and they got to go what was perceived to be a better bowl. And that was unfortunate for UVA in that they had to play in, a, in, a, in an ice bowl against a very talented Navy team who was upset that they were stuck playing in that game. So, where Duke, on the other hand, got banished off to, to Detroit where they got to play on, you know, at night at the lone game and had a, a very successful win. It was something that, that was a bad break. Cool. Bronco was concerned, and I was with you. Uh, I was nervous after his comment uh, preseason. It, it, I thought he was down playing the team. You know, hey, we're not good enough. We're, but, you know, Cut did the similar things in the second and third year. You know, he was just talking about this is what I inherited. You know, it was, no one was really taking the program in a serious manner, wanting to get to the next level. But those are those two key words, Chris. What is the next level? Yeah. Where where does the you know does if this year if I think UVA could go to Charlotte? Am I am I am I going to tell you to book your hotel room down there yet? Maybe not. But I won't be surprised if it happens. And for everybody that's a Who fan, I'm hoping that it happens. You know, I will say this. You, you ask about the next level, and, and, you know, it's still just year three for Bronco. And uh, he, what What's happening now has already far exceeded any expectations I had. And part, part of that is, you know, yeah, expectations have been diminished because dating back to the mid-2000s, you know, the middle of the Al Groh era, uh, was when the program started declining. We didn't know it then because even 2007, I think that was, Virginia won nine games that year. It was a kind of fluky year, but they won nine games. Uh, but aside from that, it's been a you know a long period of time for Virginia football to not have you know a sustained level of success like they had in the George Welsh era. And so that said, though, I'm not even sure if I'm if I'm going to qualify it and say it's in the context of all that suffering we've had as fans because uh, last year Virginia started five and one. They had that win over Boise State that we all remember. You know, big win on the blue turf, national TV. Uh, nobody expected that game, especially that dominating performance, was 42-13 to 13 at one point before, you know, Boise put up some points late to make it look a little more respectable. Uh, but 5-1 and one last year didn't feel like, it felt like sort of a slippery slope kind of 5-1, and one, you know. It felt like, oh yeah, we got lucky here, we had a, you know easy win here that shouldn't have been, but, you know, it, it feels like it's about, the tent's about to fall down, and it did, because, you know, the team didn't have depth, there were offensive line issues. You know, you had to, you really had to just kind of struggle within yourself last year because of that lack of depth. This year's five and two feels a lot different than last year's five and one. This year's five and two feels legit to me. I would go back and argue that the loss to Indiana, if they play that game again, they don't lose that game to Indiana. If they play that game in good weather, they don't lose it the first time. Uh, and uh, you know, the loss to NC State, you tip your cap. NC State played a better game that day. Virginia had turnovers. Sometimes that happens, but you know, NC State, NC State deserved that one, but. You know, I look at this rest of the schedule. I look at this team. Bryce Perkins has a different feel with the offense. Uh, you know, their offensive line has more depth. They're, they're stronger. They're bigger. The defense is flying around the football. You lose your best three defensive players to the NFL. You lose Quinn Blanding, Micah Kaiser, and Andrew Brown. You lose those guys, and you're better defensively. This is, and it's still just year three now. That's that's we had to, that's where I will put a qualifier because there's still not the depth that Bronco and his staff will have next year, the year after, etc. But yeah, I think for him to have us even talking, and not just talking like out of the top of our heads, we're talking legitimately about Virginia being a, a top contender right now. They win this weekend. They're, they're first place in the Coastal all by themselves. Feet in their own hands heading into November uh, That for the, for the ACC Coastal Division Championship. Uh, yeah, th this is far ahead of schedule because I'll, I'll be honest, 
I didn't think there was a schedule to get the ACC championship game. I did not foresee it ever happening at Virginia. It just hasn't happened yet. And if, if it's never not happened yet, why could you think it would, would happen? Uh, and so at, in year three, he has us thinking this way. He's already won my vote. Well, a couple of notes I want to add to that, and it was very, very well stated. The, um, the key thing you look at here, and this is what I think for years, uh, you know, the ACC soft, the ACC soft. The ACC is a basketball college sport league. The football is soft. And I've always hated that. I've always hated that. Well, then Clemson wins the national championship. Oh, well, you know, can they, can they sustain it? We, take a look at what Bronco is trying to do. What Cut has done, he hasn't he hasn't reached the the ten win level, but but let's take a look at Wake Forest now. Okay, going into this season, I was thoroughly impressed with the new regime down at Wake Forest. Yeah. I really thought they had turned the corner and were going to become a player in the league. And they're sitting there this 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 week. The notes tell you that it's the the loser of this game. The, the Wake Louisville game, okay, is is officially done. Whether I mean it's not as if they're not going to show up for the remaining four weeks, but you've got Wake Forest at three and four, and three of their four losses have been absolute beatdowns. Facing Louisville, who at two and five has had some of the most embarrassing. I mean, look, normally their their embarrassment is off the field. <laughs> This year, it's on the field. Yeah. So the loser of that game, if it's Wake, they go to 0-4 in the league. Louisville goes to 0-5. So it's one thing to climb the hill, which Bronco is in the process of doing. But the hill is tougher than people think. Yeah. I mean, not only, I mean, not only do you have Clemson up there, NC State, I think, is on the, on the verge of becoming a national player. You know, it's a situation to where... I just think the league as a whole is a better league. Syracuse is back on the rise. Boston College is back on the rise. And so it's, it's a two-piece battle. One, you've got to make it to the second level of the hill. And then you've got to fight to, uh, you know, to stay there. Go switch you back to the Virginia Tech situation just for a minute. I, I, I feel bad. I know Fuentes had, was the man. And... I hated to watch. I understood why Lincoln Riley did what he did at Oklahoma this in the past couple of weeks. But he he fired the brother of the guy that gave him the program. And I was sitting there thinking, how awkward was that for him? Yeah. How tough of a decision was that for him? Where Virginia Tech is concerned, and I pull for everybody. But I know, I love that Justin kept Bud Foster there. I love that he kept him there. I was one of those people that I would have gave. I would have given Foster the job for a couple of years. Yeah. But when you're a national program, you know you saw you saw UNC do that with uh, Guthrie. You know, when you're a national program, you can't do that. So at some point, I'm really hoping that Justin finds the ability to stay loyal to uh, Foster, but. That's twice now. I mean, you, you you give it up to Notre Dame, you get a little bit of a pass. But now with Georgia Tech and Old Dominion, those are two pretty loud, you know, four, I think they're both 49-point performances. But I just, you know, the, the situation in Oklahoma, that's what made me think about with Virginia Tech. I'm going, wow, Lincoln Riley is a, is a brilliant coach. And he got handed something most coaches could never get. The keys to a Mercedes. <laughs> yeah. uh, coaches have to come in and take a job and hoping that, you know, that there's enough talent there to win. He was arguably handed the second or third best job in the country. And then he had to fire the guy's brother. So, anyway, but I, I'm hoping that doesn't come play out that way. I consider myself a Bud Foster uh, fan. I like the fact that they kept him. But just like when an athletic director is not who hired the football coach, It'll be interesting to see how that one plays out going forward. Yeah, I agree. You know, Foster this year, the situation is, you know, they're almost a victim of their own success. They had a number of guys uh, leave early for the draft this year uh, that would have been 
older upperclassmen guys that would have been leading this defense. Now they're young. You know, they only had, like I said, they only had two guys who who played uh, had played against Georgia Tech previously uh, going into last night's game, and that tells you how young they are. They've had success. They gave up three points to Florida State. They've also given up, as you mentioned, 49 to ODU, 49 to Georgia Tech, and those are those are diametrically opposed ways of scoring 49. Georgia Tech threw it once. Uh, ODU threw it a lot, and those so so it's not like there's one hole there. You can say, hey, we just need to close the hole on the pass defense, and we'll be fine. But you got gash pass, and you got gash against the run. So it's that's that's a drawing board that's way too big to solve this year. Now Virginia Tech goes from last night from being three and zero, controlling their destiny in the ACC. Now they're three and one, so that's they're still there, but they still got Miami, they still got Boston College, they still got Virginia to play, uh, and who knows, somebody might sneak up as well. So, you know, you have to wonder if this is going to, if last night could be the, the, the beginning of a, you know, kind of precipitous decline, at least this season for, for, for Virginia Tech. And, you know, you look at message boards, you talked about how people, how people love to uh, act like the world's coming to an end. You look at tech message boards after a loss, that fan base is unlike the Virginia fan base. Virginia, Virginia's five and two and, and fans are, are just jumping up and down about the chance to go to Charlotte. If you're four and three and you're Virginia Tech, you definitely think the world's coming to an end. That's your sport. You're four and three in it. You just got beat again really bad, and you're wondering if you made the right hire and coach. And there's a lot of folks on their on their on in their fan base who don't like Fuente all of a sudden. Well, I wouldn't say all of a sudden. Uh, it's been sort of lingering. He, it, 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 this is another symptom of where we are in college sports, Jerry. He's won ten and nine games his first two seasons. That's not been good enough for Virginia Tech fans. Uh, 19 and seven coming into this season. I guess 23 and 10 now at this stage. Not good enough for the, the bulk of that fan base uh, who remembers that you know Frank Beamer and, and Bud Foster had them winning 10 games every year for I think it was eight or nine straight years. Uh, yeah, that's it's it's what have you done for me lately? And you know right now I think there's a a lot of a lot of bad feelings uh, you know among among the fan base and that kind of translate over. Uh, you know, to the, uh, the fundraising, everything else, it, it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I hate to see it because, you know, they're a young team this year. That's, and they had a, they lost their starting quarterback. I mean, they got a lot of issues. That happens sometimes. And, you know, defending defending that coaching staff, I think they're doing the best job they can given what they've got. Well, it's really interesting because, Chris, the words that I have circled are level of expectation. Now, I've been a 55 years old. I've been a Duke football fan for 50 of those years. So, it's, I don't think the Chicago Cubs have anything on us as far as the, the suffering. I get a kick out of the uh, Scott Van Pelt's uh, segment of Bad Beats. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, that leads each week with the same highlight. Where Duke's playing the bowl game, or you're talking about we're in Charlotte on the two yard line, tied against Cincinnati with a minute to go. <clears throat> Picture that in your head, and we lost by 14 points. Uh-huh. And that's uh, the ultimate bad beat to where I'm just like, I wish somebody would have a bigger one. So we, I have to quit seeing that. But I believe each year going, okay, here's what I want to see. I want to see a the sequence. I want to get to go to my bowl game. I want us to not get embarrassed off the field. I want us to maintain a classy operation. And if we have that year where we can sneak in, uh, eight or nine wins and go to a better bowl game, then that's great. And I think right now that, that's that got to be the same way the EVA is looking at this. The question becomes, let's say you do that for a few years, okay? Then when these windows it switch, that was a good, that was a goal for Virginia Tech at one point. But now that they've, they've flirted with the top of the mountain. And we talked and you talk about how good they've been in the past, just ask yourself, how long has it been since they've been that good? Mm-hmm. Right, and then, and then, when somebody's got to go in this scenario, <laughs> I, I'm afraid it's going to be Foster. And I don't think it's going to help the diehard we love Beamer, we love Foster people. That's not going to help. But it's inevitable. It's inevitable if you're giving up 50 a game multiple times in a year. I did want to. I did want to throw in one other fun fact. This one cracked me up. Um, Road Warriors. We were talking about the trifecta of the Georgia Tech, the King Tech, and Duke. Yeah. There are five. There are five Power Five schools that are currently three and zero on the road this year. 
Alabama, Florida, Penn State, and then the fourth one is Duke. So you take your little victory. You take your little victory. How often do you get to get lumped in anywhere with the word Alabama? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm nervous going into this weekend. Pitt is, is similar to North Carolina. Which Pitt team's going to show up? Right. A really, really bad one? Or a really, really good one? The one that played Notre Dame so tight here a couple of weeks ago, yeah. yeah. That's true. That's true. This, this league has been back and forth in a manner. Um, and I, I guess one other note while we're on the football side of things that won't get a lot of love by a lot of people, but I. Dabo is a classy guy. Chris, I thought he took a huge, huge gamble by swapping quarterback. I, I was sitting there, and, and I I thought that was a, a gutsy thing to do when you had somebody who had been part of your program and was a situation to where that you could have told yourself, well, we're good enough to win with him. Hey, it's his last year. Let's, I, I thought what he did – was uh, was a bold, bold thing to do. And if it had failed, everybody in their brother would have lined up to, to run him down for it. I don't know how many people would have made that move. Right. I, I don't know how many people would have taken that team at that level and said, hey, I'm sorry, this is what's best for our team. So that's my, my one thought on, the, you know, on that situation. I It's not like... You know, I, I, I don't know how much similarity is to Alabama and what uh, what uh, statement did at halftime of the national championship yet. But I thought what Clemson did, I, I thought it took a lot of guts by Dabo, and it was one of those things that if it works, no one's going to act like it was a big deal. And if it doesn't work, they're going to tar it better. So, uh, football has been as entertaining this year. And this week, like I said, it's the first time you have seven ACC games. And the ACC football junkie is got last night and again tonight and then five on Saturday. But here's our segue. You know the ACC is about basketball, right? There is that reputation, and it's a well-deserved one. When you look at the top 25 this week, you see seven teams in it. Uh, you see, what, Three, well, two, two in the top five, Duke, four, Virginia, five, Carolina in the top ten, what, Virginia Tech, Florida State, Clemson, um, Syracuse, I'm probably leaving somebody out. Uh, yeah, th- there there is this little thing about the ACC having some good teams every once in a while. And, uh, yeah, there, this is going to be a fun year, no question, as far as the, the up and down this conference. Well, I think there's probably a, a, there's probably a de- demarcation line. I'm not sure. Like in some years past, we've had we've had the number of good teams we have this year. But then even the teams who were sort of second division weren't far behind. I think there may be a clearer mark between, you know, first division and second division this year. But those first division teams, I mean, even going down, so, you know, Duke's four, Virginia's in, in the preseason um, uh, eight people. Duke's four, Virginia's five, and Carolina was eight. And you get to the teams in the in the teens, you know, the Virginia Techs and Syracuses and Florida States and Clemsons, those are all pretty good teams. I mean, Florida State was an elite eight team last year. Clemson made the Sweet 16. Uh, Virginia Tech comes back this year with a lot of talent. Uh, Syracuse has their starting five back for the first time in a while. This is going to be, I mean, it, you know, last year Virginia rolled through 17 and one regular season, won the ACC tournament, so 20 and one record, only lost the one game by one point in overtime. One of one of loose ball with six seconds to go that went in the basket. I don't think either Virginia or Duke, who are to me, I mean, I, I think they are head and shoulders above even the other first division teams. I think those two teams will be will be that much better than those other teams. I still think your league champion this year is going to have four or five losses because it's so tough. The grind is going to be so tough this season. The depth at the top, is they're going to knock each other around a good bit this year. Yeah, it's going to be amazing to watch the uh, the difference between the top and the middle is so huge. I, I, not only do I think that they're going to have two or three, if not four losses, because I think there's six different teams could possibly win. And I, I've always looked at what Roy gets done as a wild card. I, you know, I, 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 I remember the day that Tony got hired, and I, living out here, I was telling you, hey, you guys are patient. 
this guy. He's the real deal. His days out here at Wazoo, I've been on the Tony train for a long time, and I, I, I feel comfortable knowing what Virginia's going to put on the floor. I feel comfortable knowing what Duke's going to put on the floor. And then you, you're in a situation with UNC, they don't have, I mean, the one thing that I got to give Roy Williams credit for, whether it's by design or not, you know, every few years, he just has a team capable of winning the national championship. And when he, when he beat Gonzaga, Chris, what was so neat to me about that? Not only did the league get the win, he did it with upper classes. He did it with juniors and seniors. So, you know, so now you, you, you mentioned Clemson. What Clemson did to Auburn in the tournament was just scary. Yeah, yeah. Auburn was the regular season champion in the, and, and, and they're part of the SEC. And Clemson was threatening to, I think at one point it was like 40, 41 points. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Clemson, for years, and I know the Clemson people hate it, football team, you know, they would just give a game away, and they would call it Clemson. I hated, I hated that for them. But it's a situation to where I think the basketball team is, is, is approaching that level. Where when you're circling the schedule, you're circling the schedule, I, th- I think Clemson is, is a player or two away from in the upper group. Yeah. You know, I, I don't see, as long as Tony Bennett at UVA, UVA is not coming out of that upper group. As long as Coach K is at Duke, that's, it's, not, it's not going to happen. So the third one is always UNC. But as you just mentioned, you've got three or four people saying, hey, can we be the fourth team up there? <laughs> and it's extremely. Syracuse, I think, the same thing, you know, where, where Bayheim, and I'm not, I'm never going to get past Bayheim, yeah, get fun of Greensboro, so, but, uh, <laughs> but there's another guy, there's another guy, we both know that pain very well, that is capable of coaching a team to the final four, so, you know, they're ranked, they, they have a history, and it's, it's going to be fun, it's absolutely going to be fun. Yeah, you talked about Clemson. I wanted to throw in Brad Brownell. You know, last year there were a lot of thought. There was a lot of thought that he was on the hot seat, and then I think it's, it, it was Marquise Reed went down uh, in January. I think it was right around the time of the, of the first Virginia game uh, in mid January. And that Clemson team has started something like fourteen and two, fifteen and two. I mean, they had a great start to the season. And I'm thinking because I, I like Brownell. I like what he's done there. They 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 have a philosophy. They he, he doesn't just roll the ball out there. They play tough defense. They you know they they have a they're a guard dominant team, but they always have a big guy who can block shots. I mean, he, you can see how he wants to win basketball games, and I respect the way he's built that program there at a place that's tough to win basketball games at. And so last year they had that great start; they lose their best player, and I'm thinking, man, this is so unfair because now they're going to fall off the wayside here, and he's going to get fired because you know, because of an injury. I mean, because you, I could just see that all imploding because it seemed like they didn't have enough depth to make up for losing their best player. And what did he do? He goes to the Sweet 16, and and uh, you know he they, they gave Virginia a great game in the ACC tournament. Uh, you know everything that they did, like you mentioned, the Auburn the Auburn win in the NCAA tournament was so impressive, and and I'm impressed by that. And you know I, I'm I'm the same league, uh, the same situation, Jerry, as you as far as Bayheim goes on a personal level. I think he's a he's a bit of a jerk, but he does he he has a philosophy. He plays uh, a zone defense that. No one can figure out. He's been doing it for 40-some years, and he does it well. And he, he, he has big guys on the wings. He has a really big guy in the middle. He has great fast guards. He plays five guys 40 minutes a night, and uh, he knows how he, that's how he wants to win. He's done it since the 80s in the Big East, and you know they're, they're going to be good this year. Uh, Buzz Williams at Virginia Tech doesn't get a lot of credit. Virginia fans, and, and I'm sure most of the folks listening to this podcast at this stage almost 40 minutes in, our, our, our hardcore Virginia fans who listen to our podcast, uh, you're not going to like hearing me say this, but Buzz Williams can coach. There are a lot of people who, I, when I look at the message boards, the Virginia message boards, say, oh, Buzz can't do this, Buzz can't do that. Buzz outcoached Tony last year in that win in Charlottesville. It, think about it, and you'll have to admit it. He packed the lane uh, in that game and dared Virginia to shoot threes. And Virginia fell for it and went 12 for 38 from three-point range. Now, we lost by one point. You could say, well, if we had figured something out, if we'd done something differently or made one more three, we win the game. Yeah, all those things could have happened. It didn't happen. He he took his team 
that should have probably lost that game by 20 points. In fact, they got blown out in Blacksburg earlier in the season, and he beat Virginia, a team that ended up 31-2 in the regular season. He beat them by a point on their floor. So that's – that's uh, to me, that he, 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 he won his team a game last year they should have lost. I like Buzz Williams. His recruiting's working fine. Uh, so – and that's not even talking about the, the power of Troika at the top, UNC, Duke, and Virginia. Uh, not in that order either, I don't think, because uh, you know UNC is probably the third of the three this year. Uh, but here, here's what we get, Jerry, this year. You know, the ACC with all the teams. You know, we've got 15 teams in the league now. Uh, we don't get guaranteed home and homes with everybody. But guess what we get this year? We got a home and home, Duke and Virginia. We'll see them play twice. That's the both those games are going to be a treat. Well, this is the uh, I'm going to put on my Augusta Free Press hat for a second and, and take a second to talk about fun. The one thing that being with you at the ACC tournament to the Jay Billises and the you know and the and the like, but getting to get in the room with the coaches and get to read more or hear more than the full quote. Buzz was a huge, huge impression on me, to the point where I was saying, I never had that, I never had the warm and fuzzy feeling with Steph. I, I, I do believe that if Steph had ever had a single jump shooter, he went to at least one Final Four. There was a kid named Seth Curry who wanted to play there, for example. So, yeah. yeah. And, and then I, after after Seth Curry didn't happen, I would have signed his little brother as a seventh grader, but yeah. that's here or there. But, but Buzz, Buzz has it. It's it. And there's that word, it. What does it mean? Again, my, my our buddy uh, Lawrence, you know, talking about big picture. Buzz gets it. He gets it. He understands. He's protective of his kids. He's trying to mentor them. And again, I got, I, you know, if I don't have... 30 minutes in a room with him, I don't get to see that. So, yes, I think Buzz is the real deal. I think he's capable of accomplishing something. And when you're trying to figure out who's going to be the fourth of the four, you know, from a personal standpoint, like you mentioned all the things about Clemson and what they're doing right. I, I like Buzz. I like I like what And uh, I hope he continues to get to the next level. But, again, just like we talked about on the football side of things, there's, there's the bottom of the mountain, the middle of the mountain, and the top of the mountain. And Virginia Tech is wanting to get from the middle to the top. In basketball, they have to be aware that they're not the only ones trying to do it. <laughs> that's right. That is the state is trying desperately, is trying desperately to stay on the national stage. And I, every time they switch coaches, I get a little worried about it. And I'm sitting there saying, okay, I they're not going to get the quick fix. They're not going to. And I, I know the guy they, they brought in just recently from uh, UNC Wilmington um, was a good hire. And it's a situation to where that, I want to say, Chris, it's just in our, since I've known you, that's their third or fourth coach. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 and and at, the, at a program that has won national championships, uh, it's back in the history now. We're talking now 30 five plus years since the last one but you know you've got one you've got two actually um uh, you beat ucla way back back in the day so yeah yeah um and so it's a program with that history and that tradition in the in a fan base that at least has some lingering memories certainly the older alums and the, and the folks who followed the program for a long time remember they got a great arena uh, their 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 uh their facilities you know are great because uh, that's usually a host site for NCAA tournaments. Uh, first first two rounds of NCAA tournaments every other year. Greensboro and Raleigh rotate uh, hosting NCAA tournaments. So uh, great facilities, great fan base, you know, alums who can donate money. And, and yet they've not – the football program, too, has also, you know, underachieved. And that basketball certainly is underachieved. And I think you're right. Uh, you know, they've made – they've just made some interesting calls in terms of the coach. I like Kevin Keats. I think he's going to be the solution there. Uh, he's someone I've, I got, I knew a little bit uh, from post grad basketball. I uh, the, the school up the street from where I live, Fishburne Military School, for several years had a post grad program. Ed Huckabee was the head coach. I love Ed. Uh, Ed was a, a college assistant at a couple stops. He came here, built the program up from scratch. It was a top five program in the nation for five years. 
and Kevin Keats was at um, Hargrave, and uh, he uh, he was at, at the Hargrave postgrad program, and boy, we had some games. So those two teams, that little gym at Fishburne Military School, which you know maybe holds 200 people. There were three, 400 people hanging off the Raptors one night in a game that went uh, double overtime, 123 to 120. Montrez Harrell had 51 points and 34 rebounds. He's in the NBA now. There were like there were seven or eight guys in that game that uh, uh, played uh, you know, Big Ten or ACC or Big East basketball, and, and Keats was there part of that. I've, I've 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 seen him develop all the way from there all the way to now NC State. I think he's going to do well. Um, you know, he already has done well, but he's going to he's going to do well there if they give him enough of, enough of a leash. Uh, and I think they will because they're hungry for that, and, and he's already turned it around in the first couple of years. I love what he did at Wilmington. He played uh, Wilmington played Virginia in the NCAA tournament a couple of years ago, and folks might remember that was a that was a battle. They had a 15 point lead in the first half. It was still a close game at the end. Virginia won by four or five points. So, yeah, that guy knows how to coach, and and we haven't even talked about him. We've talked about the other seven schools in the top 25. We haven't talked about State and where the, what they're going to do this year. Right, that game got him the job at NC State. Yeah, 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 there was no, there was no doubt about that. And again, you're, I don't know, I haven't spent time around him personally. And I try to stay away from, so, oh, this guy's a good guy, if I haven't actually experienced it myself. But second-handedly, I've heard wonderful stories about him across the board. And that's what NC State needs. They need stability. I know that uh, Godfrey was a, was a named coach. And yeah, I, I know when they, they tried it with uh, bringing low back, and it's a situation to where I think NC State was trying to do a little bit like the, the Louisville football program, looking for instant gratification. Okay? That's not what happened at the other school. I remember, and whether you remember it or not, I, again, now Pullman, Washington got shown on national TV, uh-huh. but... This way, what what Pullman, Washington is, Chris, is literally 250 miles from civilization. It's just it's just out there. The weather is horrific. You burn up in the summer, you freeze in the winter, and so when Bennett was recruiting kids to come to Wazoo, and I'm going, wow, that's that that's just somebody who wants to play basketball. And I'm sitting there and I go, man, when he got the job at UVA, I'm going. Please, just give him five years. Give him five years because he's not going to play fun basketball. In fact, the national media still thinks it's bad basketball. <laughs> I, but if UVA can just remain patient, if UVA can just, the fan base can just remain patient, I felt like this guy was going to get the job done. Now, I, I thought he would get the job done. Did I think he'd get it done to this level? Right. Maybe not. But it, Sometimes when you make a hire, I, I still remember that when they hired Coach King, I wanted Paul Webb from OU to get the job, so I was kind of miffed. <laughs> couldn't pronounce, couldn't pronounce the guy's name. Hell, I still can't. I'm sorry. Heck, I still can't. <laughs> but it's a situation. It's a situation to where the third year they were hanging him from the rafters, uh, and they wanted to fire him. Think about that. You know, and then, then the guys in 86 made the run to the national championship, and, uh, and, and then it, it changed. But think about that. Think about it. If they had fired him, that, that would rank right up there with Michael Jordan getting cut from, you know, his high school team. Yeah, you know, I looked it up, though, once, because we, we've talked about that. Uh, I've talked about that with some other people before. You know, he came in. Yeah, you're right. He wasn't the choice of the fan base. He's a young guy from Army. Like, why are you hiring this guy from Army? I mean, what's what's the point? Duke Duke was already a, a national power. They'd been in the championship game, what, two years before? They'd been in the Sweet 16 two of the three years before Coach K takes over. And then you mentioned for three years, they lost. And they didn't just lose. They lost bad. You know, they the memorable uh, 40-plus point loss to UVA in the ACC tournament. And, you know, it wasn't just losing – getting your head, you know, beat in by, by good teams, but learning and getting better. Yeah, those were some bad years. But also, of course, now UNC, let's just, you know, UNC almost fired Dean Smith, too, back in the 60s. So uh, sometimes, and, and, and Virginia Tech almost fired Frank Beamer uh, in, in the early 1990s. Uh, sometimes that, that discretion, that wouldn't be there now. Let's just admit that. You know, 
there weren't there weren't message boards. There wasn't Twitter back in the 80s and 90s and 60s when all those guys were on one call. Uh, you have to wonder would would Dean Smith have survived? They they were burning him in effigy after a loss to Dean Smith back in in a bit. I think it was 65. They did that. You mentioned uh, you know third year Coach K. They want to fire him. Uh, Beamer, I think it was after his fourth year, fourth and fifth years both. Uh, Virginia Tech talked about firing him. If there are message boards, if there's Twitter, if there's Facebook, I don't know those guys survive. And then you're right, yeah. Then then we're, we're all those guys and Michael Jordan get cut from his, his 10th grade team. Uh, you know, interesting things can happen. But you know, coaches now, you know, have have to have to live in that environment. And uh, Virginia, fortunately, you know, made the right call. They told, the fan base wanted Tubby Smith. Tubby Smith's had about five jobs since that, that job went to Tony. Uh, nothing against Tubby Smith, but he's kind of bounced around. And and, uh, and Tony quietly, patiently uh, built up a program that – I remember when he got the job, Jerry, uh, you know, you and I talked, and you, you said, pay attention to Tony. He's going to be a good coach. And I looked at what he did had done at Washington State, and then I looked at the scores of the games. And I told my wife, Crystal, I told Crystal, she, 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 tell me about this Tony Bennett. What does he do? Well, he wins. He plays defense. The score of the game will be about 54 to 52, but he'll win. And she said, you know, because she knew she knows me. I mean, even to this day, I'm looking at the scores in the NBA. You know, the Warriors beat the Wizards 144-122 the other night. I love that kind of basketball. I love fast-paced, shoot the ball, run up down the court kind of basketball. So she says to me, knowing that about me, are you going to like that? As long as we score more points, Crystal, I will love it. And I have come to appreciate it. Uh, I, I think I've learned the game of basketball because I've had to learn how to watch Tony Bennett coach it. And the way he plays is a very beautiful way of playing basketball. It's very different than what you see Steph Curry do and, and a lot of the guys in the NBA now do. But it's a very cerebral approach to basketball and obviously very successful. Well, two things real quick. One, on a quick one on Tony. My fear was if he didn't get hit the ground running, he did run off before he had a chance because the pace that I like the Stanley coaches, I like the way they play, I like the way he runs his program. But if you go four and twenty-one to start of your second year, I'm not sure you're coming back. Right. But you hit on a you hit on a point. I just I have to make when you said Tubby Smith. Okay, I want to go back to Tub, Tubby Smith at Kentucky. And now my brother is uh, has a degree on his wall from Louisville, so. I'm always going to be loyal to Louisville, and I think that at the end of the day, if you have a gun in my head and said, what's the blue blood program of college basketball, okay, I would answer Kentucky. I, I'm not going to tell you I like Kentucky, but I would say Kentucky. Tubby Smith ran a nice program at Kentucky. He ran a clean program at Kentucky, and he got fired. Yeah. So championship in 10 seasons. Okay, now you and me agree. We don't agree on a lot of things, but we agree on our boy. I call the used car salesman. Calipari's been there all along. Yeah. Uh, well, about, about 10 years, right? 10 or, 10 or so years, I would guess. Yeah, there you go. He's, he's won one national championship. Yeah. I, 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 I'm sitting there, you know, and then anytime I'm around my brother and, and his friends, who all drink the Kentucky Kool-Aid, my wife is from a family of people that, have Kentucky toilet paper at their house. I'm just going I liked him when Tubby was there. I liked what Tubby was doing. But he didn't win enough. He didn't, he only got one in ten years. And I'm going uh, my, my my math tells me that Calipari's got one in the tenth year. And it's just funny about what somebody's willing to accept. But uh, go, the, what started the conversation with uh, with NC State if they'll do the same thing for this young coach that UVA did for Bennett, I think they can get where they want to go. And that's what they haven't. They've been trying to get there quickly. And unfortunately, there's that there, black cloud of did they or did they not funnel money to the, one of their players a couple of years ago. And, and they're trying to compete in a market with Duke and UNC. So it's a situation they're trying to. They've been trying to get the quick fix. I think they've now made the correct hire. They just need to let the guy do his stuff. I agree. I agree, and I think I think that will work. Just like Brownell at Clemson, you, know, you get Buzz Williams at Virginia Tech. You, you hire the right guy, and you let him. You let him. Bennett at Virginia, obviously too. 
Okay, so Jerry, let's let's get to uh, November sixth. It's still or uh, it's still well, a week and a half off, uh, and we've got all this football to watch between now and then. But November sixth, I mean, now I, I love football. I, I, I'm, I, I do football announcing work for ESPN. I do baseball announcing work for ESPN. I don't do basketball announcing work. That's odd. I think basketball is the sport I love the most. It might be the sport I know the best, but I don't do basketball announcing. But fortunately for me, I get to watch the number five team in the country play. 30 odd some odd times a year as a result of not having basketball responsibility uh, broadcasting responsibilities and so on november 6th i get to watch the number five team play towson that's you know it's, it's a game it's, it's it's basketball it's competitive you're going to be on november 6th now so i'm watching number five you're watching what one two and four who, who do you get to see on november 6th which makes me want to call Izzo up and ask him what he's doing <laughs> You know, you're sitting there and you're really bad that Michigan State is the 10th ranked team. And to being an afterthought, the other day on ESPN, I'm walking by a TV in the gym, and it says on there, 1, 2, 4, and, and 10. It doesn't say Michigan State. It has this party logo, but it says Michigan. <laughs> and I'm going, no, I'm certainly somebody got in trouble for making that goof. Yes. But you're sitting there. And most of the time, you come into the preseason with the tenth ranked, the tenth ranked team. You're feeling pretty good about it. Uh, actually, is one of those people that that uh, doesn't get that pass. And, and that's the the next level for me. And I know, uh, you know. So it, what it is, it's going to be number one Kansas, and it's going to be number two Kentucky, uh, number four Duke, and number ten Michigan State. Uh, Michigan State is going to open up and play Kansas in the, uh, we'll call that one the JV game, if you will. <laughs> Varsity game, at, uh, which will tip about 9.30 on the East Coast, will be Duke, Kentucky. And, you know, it's funny, where Duke, Kentucky is concerned, you know, all of the the, 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 the ill feeling, ill involved later in his perfect game, that be the... Uh, to beat Kentucky. Mine goes back a little bit earlier. You mentioned how what, what Duke was right before K got there. As a 15 year old, 1978. And I can still tell you the starting five for Duke. And they're all young. They're very young. But that was when Spinarco was there, and Banks was there, and Jaminski was there, and uh, Denard. And they're playing this, they're playing Kentucky. And, Kentucky has this guy named uh, Goose Gibbs. And I don't know if Goose ever up in any real time in the, in the NBA or not. But Goose that night scored 41 points in the national championship game, and including making one shot that hit the side of the backboard before it went in. Kentucky <laughs> wins the game 94-88. So if you, have, you see Duke, Kentucky, in most people's mind, they flash back to later in the past from Grand Hill. Sadly, I flash back to Goose Gibbons. Now, Bill Foster, which was confusing back then because there were two Bill Fosters that coached ACC basketball. I think Bill Foster was done at Duke after that group graduated. And uh, it was probably his best shot at actually winning something. But it's, it's a great rivalry. It doesn't happen that often. Um, I am, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing both games. At the same time, I, I have to put an asterisk by it. And somebody said it uh, really well in an article the other day. I don't want to take credit for the thought. But uh, I fell in love with a four-year kid at Duke. I, I fell in love, liked him, hate him. J.J. Reddick, Shane Battier, Jimmy Spinarkle, Grant Hill, the people that came there. They wore the jersey for four years. I'm going to say Grayson Allen. That'll, that'll hurt some people. But the people that wore the jersey for four years, um, are the, those are the kids that don't love. So while that game is going to be an incredible game to watch, uh, you're sitting there in the process going, who on this team is going to be there next season? And that's one of the reasons I love the women's game as much as I do because you get a chance to build a four-year relationship with players. 
as far as becoming a fan and, and watching the play and looking forward to it. Um, with that said, I was uh, uh, Michael Jordan, if a player came up, they would say, that's Michael Jordan. And I'd always laugh. And uh, there's never going to be. The kids at Duke this year, I, as I told my son, Chris, I said, I think we could be looking at the next LeBron James. And it's, it's funny from a standpoint, having watched them play in Canada, the three games, and having watched them um, play them at like from the preseason game with Virginia Union, it's just the talent level on this year's team is going to be the highest it's ever been. And not, not flinch. With that said, will they be able to find the chemistry that they need to get it done? I, I don't know. But they're going to be, but they're going to be fun to watch. And, uh, and you know, a few years back, um, the year that uh, Javari Parker was a freshman, mm-hmm. and, and he didn't, he didn't come back. Um, and after watching the next group. I joked, I said, Javari Parker, uh, starting five. <laughs> <laughs> and the kids last year for Duke, they all, you know, they, they're, 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 the Bagley is going to make a nice, has going to have a nice career. Bagley's going to have a nice career. Carter is going to have a nice career. Uh, I think the guards are going to be okay. A player than given credit for. But once again, I don't know that these guys could play with the guys on this year's team. Um, with that said, we're back to that same thought process, the level of expectation. Okay? If Duke does anything but win the national championship, Chris, they had a bad year. And that's, I, I don't know that that's fair. The last year, they, they – I love the fact when they had a shot to win it in regulation. Um, it was Grayson's shot. It should have been his shot. He, he paid his dues for the four years. They lost by a bunch right, to an, an incredibly good Kansas team. But by the unrealistic expectations, it was a bad year. They didn't win at all. So from that standpoint, I, I know that Kentucky picked up, uh, on top of all of the kids they have coming in, for the first time, a few of them, came back, and then they just picked up, uh, he's not getting a lot of pl- uh, press, but a, a grad student from Stanford, mm-hmm. who was one of the most hard-nosed players in the Pac-12 last year. So, Kentucky is, this is probably uh, as deep of a team as Calipari's had. And, uh, so like I said, it's got a don't believe about the JV and the bars. It's going to be a fun night, and it's going to be a great atmosphere in the building. And uh, really looking forward to it. I just, if you get a chance to see these kids play, and uh, you can take pick which one of them you want, to, which one of the big three you want to talk about for Duke. But they're bigger and stronger. The one as I am just looks like LeBron. You know, Coach K was trying to talk about him beforehand. <laughs> and you're just trying to picture that in your head. And then you see the guy, and you see the amount of grace that he plays with. So it's going to be a great night. I I hope that the talk of the, uh, you know, all the, the courts will, will kind of quiet by then, and people can enjoy the, uh, the night for what it is. Yeah, uh, you know, my, my thought on, on Duke this year is actually it's, it's similar to what has been in past years. It, it, same with Kentucky, uh, and, and not specific necessarily to this group or, or, or anything like that, but when you when you change your roster over as much as, as those teams do, it gets tough. Last year's team was the first one I thought. Now, they of course, they went to the Elite Eight eventually, but they didn't really play anything resembling Coach K basketball defensively. They ended up having to play zone so much because they just couldn't integrate – and play enough, you know, play good enough man-to-man for Coach K. And that's an issue when you've got guys for, for 
one season. You know, you have to sell, you have to sell them on something that maybe they don't want. I mean, if you got three kids who are the top three recruits in the class, like they do this year, okay, great. You can score thirty points a game. That's awesome. I mean, and you're going to be drafted in the top five of the draft next year. You're going to make a lot of money in the NBA. But this year, we need you to play some defense. You know, and that's that could be an issue. And you look at the one and done era for Coach K, dating back to Kyrie Irving. They've won one championship. And they've also lost in the first round a couple times. Uh, Kyrie's team, of course, Kyrie was injured most of that season. Uh, Jabari Parker's team lost in the first round. So, you know, it's feast or famine with with those groups. And, you know, I, it, it's what it is. You you know, you, you ha- when you bring that new talent in, the kids who were here, like the, the kids last year who left, there was one of the kids that didn't get drafted. Uh, and I can't think which one that was, but one of the kids didn't get drafted. But he saw the kids coming in and said, "You know what? I'm not playing. I'm not going to be playing much next year because they got those guys coming in. So I better test the waters here because I'm not going to be doing much else." Um, I would worry too. One, uh, just real quick, and then I'll let you. One thing that would worry me about this group as opposed to the, uh, the previous groups, I don't know who 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 sort of pulls himself in and says, "All right, I'm not. I don't need to shoot the ball 25 times. I want I want to distribute and help my other teammates." I see each of those three guys, at least at first, as being the, 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 the number one guy. They all see themselves as being the number one guy. And at some point, you know, there's only one ball on the court. Uh, you know, you got to work with your team. So that will happen over time. Um, you, you know, and we'll see, that, that will determine the success of this Duke team. Well, the thing that uh, is Jones' little brother who led the team the national championship and then last is a true-to-form point guard. That's what you didn't have last year. And that's why, not only did they not play defense, you couldn't have described Duke's team any better than you just did. Not only did they, were they not playing defense, he was having to put Grayson at the point. And that's not his natural position. Okay? You know, the, the, the guards were nice guards, and they might have nice NBA careers. But they weren't necessarily really solid college guards. Uh, they'll have that this year. And you know, uh, going back to Kyrie, that was an interesting situation. That was the only time that I was kind of bummed by a coaching decision. Um, now, they didn't lose in the first game Kyrie's year, but he played nine games and then was gone. The team recovered. They had a nice team going into the tournament. Kyrie hadn't played in four months. Okay. I believe it was Arizona, and tried to have him dominate a game that he hadn't played in four months. And I'm just sitting there at that point. I feel pretty good about the fact that, you know, if you're a fan for five decades, that's the, the only time where you're going, huh, I'm not sure I would have done that. I would have, I would have let the kids kind of look. So do I think these guys are going to win a national championship? I do not. Do I think these guys are going to fill the highlight reel on ESPN every night? Absolutely. I think they're better than the kids from last year. They have a better shot at it. Um, but Chris, my comparison to, to Duke basketball is a lot. Uh, let's, let's take a look at Barry Bonds for a minute. The question will always be, did he or did he? You know, and the tough part for me about that is Barry Bonds, in my mind, was a Hall of Fame player before, okay, I'm not going to, you know, before, he was already an elite player. And I can't tell you how bad I want the one and done to go away because Coach K didn't win 1,100 games coaching the one and done. And I know that there's a lot of similarities between Calipari and Coach K in some people's minds. I don't think so. It's a situation where I'm I'm anxious. I wish Silver would pull the uh, and make it and make it go away because it takes away from the fun. Last year we got to watch uh, round one and round two of the NCAA on the women. Rebecca Greenwell, uh, Lexi Brown, both started their entire careers. You get to watch somebody for four and they've redshirted for five years. You have a chance to understand the game. It's fun. When something comes for a year, uh, some of them are hitting things more than others. I don't know. Tyler, phenomenal. 
uh, relationship to this day. But let's take a look at somebody a couple of years back that was the number one can't miss, uh, Giles. Yeah. Got hurt. Got hurt. Never, never got into shape. Never played. Um, scored three points a game. And then he cashed out. And I think he's in Sacramento this year. His, his rookie year was somebody who um, he had to sit out his, his, his rookie year. Well, yeah. that's somebody that, in my mind, has no ties to Duke. And uh, uh, when you think about the people, you know, Williams, uh, another person I got to meet personally, thanks to knowing you, uh, one of the most amazing people I've ever run into. But now, he plays three years, uh, two-time national player of the year, which I believe has not happened since, and is in a situation to where, oh, he didn't save for his senior year. Well, here's the fun fact. How he graduated? It was a situation to where there's somebody who is out there making a nice living for himself. What happened with him was a motorcycle accident. It's still horrible. But like I said, it's, it's funny it's, to hear as a as a Duke basketball fan to say, wow, if they ended the one and done tomorrow, I'd feel pretty good about it. Because I Coach K still have another 400 wins in him. And he's just trying to recruit the best players. Where I do believe that Calipari is trying to go to different places and get the kid whose sole thought process is, let me play in the NBA. And the group last year with the guards, and you said it incredibly well. I don't know they were going to play this year. And uh, the one that didn't get, that didn't get drafted signed as a free agent and trying to make it. And Nathan Carter will have nice careers. But these guys this year, uh, are, the barring an injury, will be as good as they ever wore the uniform. I say that, but it's sad to me to know that they're only going to wear it for one season. Yeah, and you know what bothers me about it all too, and it's, they're not the only. Obviously, Duke's not the only school that, that plays Arizona and Kentucky, as we mentioned. Even Carolina's got a kid this year; it's probably going to play one year. Those kids, you know, th- there's a lot of question as to whether they even go to school after the NCAA tournament's over because they're getting ready for the NBA draft, and they don't need to complete their the classes. Some kids do, some kids don't. You're not required to. You just got to stay in school as long as you're playing on the court. So, yeah, you know. Um, I'm glad, you know, I mean, Tony Bennett has said too, Hey, I would take, I would take a kid if he wants to come here, but you know, he, DeAndre Hunter sat for a year at Virginia. He sat, he, he redshirted for a year at Virginia. He's a, he's, he's projected to be a lottery pick this year in the draft. Um, would have been a late first round pick last year, according to all indications. So Tony says he would take one. So I hope that he never does. Um, that piece of paper I've got hanging on my wall right up here is, is valuable, and uh, I hope it continues to be so. <laughs> and uh, it's valuable because the people who, who start there finish there and respect it. And um, I hope that continues to be the case uh, at, at Virginia, and I'm glad it is. And, uh, you know, that's I – think, I think college basketball, eventually the NBA will uh, figure out a solution to this, uh, and, and college basketball will work together. They'll work together and figure out a solution to this. Um, because to me, it's it's immoral to deny those kids the chance to make money when the open market would want them to make the money. It, for a long time, Kobe Bryant, uh, Kevin Garnett are, are two great examples of guys who came right out. LeBron James all came out of high school and went to the NBA and, and, and had a chance to make money. And the market said, we want you and, and that kind of thing. And so now that's why you see, that's why this trial was in, I guess it was New York this week that had gone on for the last few weeks. Because, you know, those kids, those kids are valuable, and, and so the money trading hands under the table, and uh, you know, if, if we got if we got rid of those ten or fifteen kids a year, we wouldn't have that kind of stuff tainting our sports, and college basketball will do just fine. There's still plenty of guys outside of those ten or fifteen that will have us enjoy November through April. The same way we do now. It just there'll be ten or fifteen less guys playing for one year. That's the only difference. And to me, that would bring that would bring some measure of of respectability to college basketball that maybe isn't there now. That trial is really, you know, it's really exposed an ugly underbelly to to college sports that I think a lot of us wish we hadn't really seen. Well, it's funny. I, I, I my, my first 
first thought as you were wrapping that up was to say, amen, brother. I, I'm going to take the flip side of the trial scenario. Because you're right. If you take the tip top 15 out, it's not like all of a sudden the game's going to fall by the wayside. But if you think about it, if you think about how many schools, how many players, how many agents, how many shoe contracts, okay, are involved, I got to kind of be impressed as to how few of these there are. How few, how few of these trials there are. You know, from a standpoint of, I remember last year, uh, the, you know, Coach K was talking about the NCAA compliance and what kids have to go through as freshmen. And the, when the Carter's name came up, Car- Carter's name came up, and uh, there was a, they, it, made a, it made one of the cheat sheets, if you will, all the I wanted to talk about. And what had happened with Carter, his parents had agreed to meet with somebody who wanted to talk to them about something. Three, three minutes into the conversation, Carter huh? said, we're leaving. This is not a conversation we're going to participate in. Okay? So now, in that scenario, in that scenario, the guy turns in his expense for the meal. What does it say? He met with Mr. and Mrs. Carter. They're, you're, and, and, and you're, you're going through this, and again, that's just that's one that's one example. I'm not saying that everybody's, you know, free of guilt. But the situation last year in Arizona, Chris, was one of the more mind-boggling things I've ever seen. And you're talking about that, that. Somebody says, we have on tape the Arizona head coach talking about the $100,000 for the Senate. Are we speculating about this? They sat. They sat the coach down for a game. He didn't. He didn't coach at Oregon. They sat him down for a game, and then they let the player play. And then, then we spend weeks where the one side's going, well, "We have proof," and the other side saying, well, "Show us the proof." It, play the tape, or move on to the next news cycle. In my mind. <laughs> These people that I, I believe the grace, the game of college basketball at all three levels, and on both sides, male and female, is the most incredible sport out there. And you take a look at how many schools are out there, how many coaches are out there, how many shoe companies are out there. The fact that there's no more than this, I feel relieved. By. I would, I would, I wish I could have your optimism. I would say this is the first of, of potentially many, and I, I would also say cynically. The NCAA has known about this for a long time, and they've not done anything about it. The old joke is, you know, if UNC gets caught doing something, they're going to go punish Butler for it or, or punish somebody, you know, some other mid-major or go you know, North Greensboro State, you know, in Carolina with that, 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 you know, academic program that was a fraud for 20-plus years. I mean, and then, you know, you talked about not a, not a lot of people being involved. Miami was implicated in it. Miami basketball. I would never have thought in a million years Jim Laranega would let anything with his program be associated with something like this. And Miami's not a big player. And, and it's not like, you know, I was not surprised Louisville. I was not surprised Arizona. Kansas Kansas has an assistant coach tied to this. I mean, those kind of programs. Now, I'm, I'm surprised at Kansas because I thought better of Bill Self. And I hope that something happens there that will, will exonerate him at least. But... The program feels tainted to me as a, as a result of what we've heard in this, this this trial. But you know they're a big pro, they're a blue blood program. They're a big program. Arizona's a big program. Louisville's sort of a big program. Miami's not. Miami is is a is a is a good program. They're an NCAA tournament contender every year in the ACC, but they're not a marquee program. And so it makes me wonder, Jerry. I hope. I wish I could have the same. Um, uh, optimism that this is the only thing we're going to ever see and it's all going to go away. I don't, you know, until to me, until the NBA and NCAA figure out how to get those kids who are so talented, who deserve the chance to go pro as soon as they can go pro. If those guys go, why, why will we give anybody else money? You're not going to give uh, four star recruits who are number 100 in their class a lot of money to go play basketball because, you know, the, the reason you, you paid. The, the the you know or offer money to those those great top recruits is because 
in one year they can change your program around. Uh, and, and that's that's the issue. So I hope I hope that is resolved by the NBA and the NCAA just so that it can clean that sport that I love, like you, the most. Hope it can clean it up even more. Well, I want to I say like one thing. I'm not saying that I think the case in New York is the only case. I'm saying is that there are going to be more things. I was mentioning Auburn had a coach that lost his job, yeah. you know, over this as well. Yeah. I'm just hoping that this, you're right, that the third, the third string guard at Syracuse, we're not worried about whose tennis shoes he's wearing. I just, I, I'm, I, I have to hope that there's a cap to this. I, I'm with you. I, I thought this, that this, I took the Miami one personally. Watched the coach his whole career. Yeah. George Mason, and and I'm just going okay. I uh, I, I couldn't believe Rick Pitino when he said he was unaware of all this. <laughs> you know, I mean, so to me, the the, the 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 enemy here is the shoe companies. Yeah. They're talking about the Kansas deal that is still unsigned. Okay, team for a hundred and eighteen. Million. I want that was the, the pause there was for the Austin Powers finger to the mouth. You know, hundred and eighteen million dollars that a shoe company is giving a school to wear their shoes. Is that is that not insane? Well, the the shoe companies are. I'll, I'll say that they're definitely a part of the problem. I would say this too, and if I if I say this, this could lead to another five hours of podcasting. So maybe we'll save the the lengthy. Discussion for another day, but the in, bas- college basketball makes billions. The NCAA, the CBS, Turner pay uh, the the NCAA and the Associated Leagues billions for the rights to broadcast those games. Football makes billions. ESPN and, and Fox and all those they pay billions to broadcast football games. Now, the kids get scholarships. The kids are 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 doing more than the value of those scholarships in terms of uh, bringing revenue to their schools, to the conferences, to the NCAA, and they're getting paid pennies on the dollar. That's why these dollars are out there because there's so many dollars in the sports. There are billions of dollars being thrown around. I love Tony Bennett. He's getting paid $3 million. Bronco Mendenhall's getting paid $3 million. They're not out there. They're not altruist out there making $50,000 leading young men to greater things. They're getting paid a lot of money to lead young men to great things. And I, and I understand that. That's a business part of it. But the kids don't get to partake in that. And so when you offer $100,000 theoretically to a kid to go to your school, he's thinking, great, because they're making millions off of, off of me and other guys. So, you know, that's a bigger issue that the NCAA needs to take a bite of, and they probably never will because, well, they haven't yet, and we've known this for a long time. But that's that's – that's tough for me. I love college. I love college sports, man. I don't write about pro sports that much. I write about college sports all the time, but I do have a philosophical issue with the fact that I feel like the, the athletes are exploited, and it's I don't I don't know the answer. I do know the question is how do how do we reconcile that? Yeah, you're correct in your thinking. That would probably fill up a podcast or two for sure, and 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 it, and it takes away from the joy. Yeah. And, you know, for that one night in Indianapolis, I I'm really hoping it, it has become such a big business. And I think the similarity is every time an NFL player gets arrested, okay, 24/7 news cycle, we're going to hear about it. Yeah. So there's 30 some teams times 53 times players, you know. So somebody says, well, all NFL players are just criminals. Well, I think they differ. Uh, you know, in the Major League Baseball says that uh, Mike Trout has a problem. He's not willing to promote himself enough to become the next superstar. I think they differ. I think I love the Angels to immediately follow that statement yeah. with, we thank Mike Trout for being Mike Trout. But again, it's, a, it's, it's, it's that gratification that, you know, it, it's a... Uh, it's, um, what have you done for me lately? How can you make me money? What's the for me? And I, I'm sure that college football has its closet full of things I don't want to know. They're just not as public as college basketball. 
And I think it just, it's just a fact when we just got affected by this twice. Think about this. College football is such a money-making machine that if you buy a ticket, a ticket, okay, to a D1 game, you don't know when that game is being played until 12 days beforehand. Wrap your hands, wrap your hands on that. That's how big college football is. Now, that doesn't come up in the average person's conversation. Right. You're sitting here and you you go out and you, let's say you're a hardworking person and you want to take your wife and kids to a UVA football game. And you live in, I don't know, you live in Bristol. Yeah. You're trying to plan that out. Your wife says, well, hey, honey, that's awesome. The kids are going to love that. When are they playing? Well, they might play at noon. <laughs> <laughs> And then they might play at seven. And so, but see, that doesn't, to me, that's annoying. Yeah. Yeah. That's annoying. But I get it. It's how they pay the bills. It's how they pay the bills. You know, college football is, I think college football is a bigger money making machine, or as big of a money making machine as college basketball. Oh, you know, it's funny about that, and I'll say this real quick. I, I looked at UVA athletics revenues a couple weeks ago. I was writing a story about something else. And, and I was surprised to see some of the numbers. Uh, I, I wasn't surprised that football made more money than basketball because you play football in a bigger stadium. It's how much more, even at UVA, where for the last several years we've not had great attendance. UVA only averages 40,000 per game the last three years in a 60,000-plus seat stadium. And yet still, and with basketball, the arena is packed every night because you're playing, you're the top five team in the country and have been for several years now. UVA football brings in double what UVA basketball does, even with that anemic football program that nobody goes to see, uh, versus a basketball team that everybody can't wait to see. It still brings in double the money from a ticket sales standpoint. So yeah, it's funny how much how how that is. Um, yeah, it's it's a money maker, uh, and, and that's you know that's why they're all out there fighting for these these extra dollars. The more butts you can put in seats and. The more big games you can play in, even more money for your program. Now you take a look at just just my own recent situation of going to the uh, again with my daughter teaching at the University of Georgia, going to a Georgia football game, which that is I have a little because I needed to know. Fourteenth largest stadium in the world. Fourteenth largest stadium in the world. She's ninety four thousand people. We didn't have the best seats. We didn't have the worst seats, but I'll tell you, we paid seventy five dollars a ticket. An average, the face value of the ticket, the average ticket price. Yeah, Chris, that's one game. And that's before, that's before the network writes a check. Yes. So that's the question to me is, what is college football doing with the gazillion dollars? That they're they're do they hide it better? Do they? And again, we're not dealing with one and done. That's right. That's the, I think that's the this issue. The NFL. Uh, you know, you have to be out of out of high school for three years to, to go to the NFL draft. And also, it's kind of like the same thing. You know, you hear NFL players these days, NFL players complain about the contracts NBA guys get because they're looking at, at uh, you know, seventh or eighth guys off the bench signing $10 million four-year or five-year deals, you know. And, like, why is this guy making $50 million in four years? I didn't even hear his name before. And I'm a star in the NFL. Well, because there's 53 guys on a football team and there's 12 guys on a basketball team. In college football, it's even more so. It's 85 scholarships in, in college football, and, and there's 13 men's basketball scholarships. So, you know, yeah, then they have to they have to germinate longer. It takes them three years at least before they can go to the NFL versus versus the you know the, the potential to at least be a one and done in, in college basketball. So, uh, you know, I think that there's maybe two factors there. Uh, but then, you know, also Jerry, I would say this. We are fans of the ACC, which is, you know, they're, they're, obviously Clemson and Florida State have both won national championships in the last five or six years in football. Um, but outside of those two schools, the rest of us play decent football, but we're not, we're not serious like that. We're not the SEC, basically, is what, I, is what I'd say. So if we were, I would wonder if we were, if we followed SEC football more closely than we do, which I don't follow it at all, to be honest with you. But if we followed SEC football the same way we follow the ACC, I would wonder what our thought process would be about the money, uh, you know, the money aspect to to college football. And I bet we would have probably pretty strong opinions about that. Well, you take uh, one one example. 
right off the top where that's concerned. You're going, Jimbo Fisher. Why would the guy willingly leave a great job yeah. Yeah. to take a $70 million job? Okay? Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're sitting there, and, the, and, the, and it's the key word. It, it's the language. It's the guarantees. It's the buyout. It was all guaranteed. Yeah, it was $75 million guaranteed. He could lose for 10 years and make $75 million. Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> Two weeks ago, Chris, I, I, I picked this up, I picked up a Friday copy of USA Today. And they had a poll quote, and it was somebody in the University of Louisville Athletic Office saying, sure, we're up to fire Bobby Petrino, but our problem is he First of all, I don't know why you say that publicly, yeah. unless you're trying to get somebody to start a just fund me page. Yeah. But, you know, Jimbo Fisher, again, he could never win another football game. Yeah. I believe his fourth generation is not taken care of. <laughs> pretty good, yeah. I mean, if he doesn't go out and, you know, it's, it's a unique world. I mean, SEC is, is definitely big boy football for sure. Um, it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting situation, and I wouldn't want to be a head coach in the SEC because I just don't know again the level of expectation. But I love the level of expectation because Old Miss did me a favor by firing cut. They're the only one to. So. And I'll say this to, to wrap that part of it up, because I think you were leaning us in this one direction for a, a few minutes ago. Here's what I do. I think about these kind of things Monday through Friday, like during the day when I'm sitting at my desk writing stories for Augusta Free Press. I think about these issues because, I mean, they interest me and, and concern me, and I like to research them and write about them, and people like to read about them too. But here's what I do when I get to the game, like tomorrow. I've, I've got a UVA uh, kicking off at 12.20 tomorrow. North Carolina's in town. So when, when I get there and I sit in my seat in the press box, I'm thinking about football. Uh, Tuesday night, November 6th at 7 o'clock when, when, uh, uh, the, at JPJ when uh, we hear uh, the, um, the ACDC song, uh, Thunderstruck, which is the, the song they play right before tip-off at JPJ. When that song starts playing, my heart's racing, and I'm thinking basketball. And, and, and I'm, in, I'm in heaven for two or three hours, uh, and even for a few minutes afterwards when I get to write about it and talk about it and all that kind of stuff. You know, all these issues here, they kind of go by the wayside because it's all those issues are about those two or three hours. And those those two or three hours, the, 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 what leads to it and what happens afterwards can be a headache, but those two or three hours are, are bliss. And so that's that's why we're here, right? That's, that's the point I was making about that night in Indianapolis. Yeah. I'm real hoping that the five hours we start to finish uh, live up to the hype. And it is about the game. And I really have not been involved in the outside stuff, but there's so much of it, you can't hide from it. You're, but you, it's there, and we live in a different day and age than I grew up in, you know, the, with everything being a 24-7 news cycle. And, and uh, you know, I, I, great example, of, I guess Carr from Oakland got hit hard enough the other day that he uh, shed a few tears. I'm pretty sure that... That happened on a pretty regular basis back 30 years ago. The way that people like Nick Bonacani and those got two people, okay? But you know what wouldn't have happened? It wouldn't have been a national news story. It wouldn't be a story, oh, he's lost the locker room now because he had tears in his eyes. It's, it's the world we live in, but I just try to – I live on an island, and I try to avoid that part of it. I like, I like watching basketball. I like watching football at the collegiate level. And anything they can do to purify the game, I'm all on 100% on board for that. Well, that's the part I enjoy. I, you know, I, I, I can't say I don't enjoy the, the – I, 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 a past life, I was a, an award-winning investigative reporter. That's what got me into journalism was curiosity. So, uh, But, yes, I enjoy the games, and I can't wait. Tomorrow I've got a football game. I've, we've got another – you know, unfortunately, I got two football games next weekend because UVA plays Friday night, and I've got VMI broadcasting on Saturday. Then the following Tuesday, I've got basketball. There are worse things than being busy with all these sports. So, um, well, Jerry, let's let's you know we're an hour and a half into this. Let's go ahead and, and, and uh, call off for now. But you know what? We got more to talk about next week. Certainly, in a couple weeks with all the basketball. So uh, let, let's let's uh, end the long line. Our first intercontinental. Well, no, 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 our first international 
podcast ever in Augusta Free Press history. It has been an honor, sir. Well, I tell you what, there's nobody I'd rather talk sports with than Chris Graham. And uh, I honestly look forward to it. And it's a situation to where any time that we can do it, and I can't promise be there but uh it's been a blast and i'm hoping that uh it was as enjoyable for the folks listening as it was for uh at least on my end to have the conversation for our listeners out there i'll sign off as i always do wahoo wah